Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the program where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam of the previous week in terms of Vatican and global church headlines, trying to make sense of it all. Of course, past week, past week was a unique week because it was Holy Week, 2023. So we're going to begin with three reflections on Holy Week. One, the unsinkable Pope Francis. Holy Week marks a return to form, a triumphant bravura performance by the Pope laying to rest doubts about his health following a surprise hospitalization the week before. Second, messaging and multilateralism, how Pope Francis used the media platform created by Holy Week to reconfirm the Vatican's commitment to multilateralism in foreign affairs. And third, traces of Benedict. This was the first Holy Week without Pope Benedict XVI. Nevertheless, for those with eyes to see, there were traces of the late Pope throughout the week. And then we'll also touch upon two news stories that percolated during the week. One, should it stay or should it go? A mounting debate about whether artwork created by sexual abusers ought to be removed from sacred spaces. And finally, the hour of the nuns. Pope Francis appoints yet another religious woman to a position of leadership in the Vatican. We'll explain who she is and why it matters. All that is waiting for you on this week's edition of Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, April 11th in the year of our Lord, 2023. If you're a regular watcher of this show, you know we actually film it on Monday. So today in Italy is what's known as Pasquetta, the Little Easter. Easter Monday here is a national holiday. In some way, Italians take this more seriously and with deeper religious fervor than they actually do Easter Sunday. Nobody in this country works on Pasquetta. I was out early this morning walking our pugs, and it was like a post-apocalyptic wasteland in our neighborhood, nobody moving at all. So if you ever need proof of our devotion here at Last Week in the Church to bringing you the latest and greatest on the Vatican beat, the fact that we are working today, you will never need further proof than that. So let's dive in. We are just coming off Holy Week. Hope you all had a fantastic and blessed Holy Week. You know who had a great Holy Week? Pope Francis. The big question mark heading into Holy Week 2023 was, of course, about the Pope's health. He had just the day before this all began, that is the day before Palm Sunday, so last Saturday, he had come out of Rome's Gemelli Hospital after spending three nights there to treat a bout of bronchitis brought on by respiratory problems, that is, he was having difficulty breathing had to be rushed to the hospital despite the Vatican's effort to put a calm face on things, saying these were planned checkups. You know, the truth of it is, it was very clear that there had been a borderline crisis moment. And so when Francis came out of the hospital, there was concern. Is he going to be weakened? Is he going to be able to lead, able to govern? Are we entering a fin du regime moment in which the end is at hand? Well, frankly, his conduct on Saturday, the day he got out of the hospital, when he spent a good half hour standing outside of the Gemelli, engaging in a back and forth with reporters, signing the cast of an Italian little boy who had broken his arm, comforting a couple who had lost their child. I mean, that should have laid those doubts to rest. But to the extent that there were lingering concerns, they have largely, I think, been shelved in the wake of the Pope's performance this week. He made every one of his Holy Week appointments with the lone exception of the Via Crucis or Way of the Cross procession Friday evening. And frankly, it made no sense whatsoever for the Pope to be there. It was unseasonably cold in Rome this past week. Friday night, factoring in wind chills, the temperature at around 10 or 11 o'clock, which would have been the hour Francis would have been there outside at the Colosseum, would have been in the high 30s, low 40s, just for somebody coming off bronchitis. It would have been a fool's errand. But beyond that, he made absolutely everything. Now, he followed this formula in which he presided over the liturgies of Holy Week, but did not celebrate. 
And that's not new to this Holy Week, by the way. That's been the case for a while. It's a product not so much of his most recent health scare, but of his sciatica, this nerve condition in the back and legs, which makes it painful for him to stand and walk. So he can't really stand at the altar and celebrate, so somebody else does that for him. But otherwise, he was there for everything, and he was in good form. His voice was clear and confident. You know, he was able to ad lib at many points along the way, including the Mass of the Lord's Supper Thursday night when he visited a youth prison to wish the feet of 12 inmates. He, he ad libbed his whole homily and was in command, in control the whole way. There was never a moment in which you felt, my God, this is a pope who was on the verge of collapse. Certainly there were moments he seemed tired, but frankly, if you had had to sit there in full liturgical vestments for, you know, two or three major liturgies on the same day, you know, there would have been moments when you would have been looking a little, you know, peaked as well. But fundamentally, he came through it in fine fashion. And I think now the conversation is going to shift away from, is this the end of the Francis papacy, to what does this reinvigorated pope with a new lease on life intend to do with it? All right. Second reflection on Holy Week. You know, Easter and Christmas are, of course, the most sacred periods on the Christian calendar every year. But from a PR point of view, they are also the biggest media platforms of every year for a pope because they are two moments when the eyes of the entire world are trained on what's happening in Rome and ears are opened to whatever it is the pope has to say. So it is always worth asking yourself, what messages was the Pope, any Pope really, trying to send during this particular moment? And certainly one of the messages I think we got clearly from Pope Francis during this Holy Week was a new commitment to what we can broadly call multilateralism in terms of the Vatican's approach to foreign affairs. That is, trying to emphasize coalitions of nations as opposed to the Vatican being identified with one block or one sort of faction in the global chess match. Traditionally, the Vatican has been understood as a Western power and has often acted in tandem with the Western powers. However, under history's first pontiff from the developing world and first pontiff from the global south, that de facto alliance with the West is a thing of the past. We are in a new era in which the Vatican wants to be, and very much is in most respects, a genuinely multilateral, non-aligned global actor. Where did we see this? Well, very clearly, that Via Crucis procession Friday night. You may remember last year, the Vatican's Good Friday celebration or service generated a bit of a contretemps with Ukrainians because Pope Francis had asked a Ukrainian and a Russian woman, both nurses who are also friends, to carry the cross together at one point during the Via Crucis procession in what was obviously intended to be a gesture of friendship across conflict and reconciliation between these two peoples, the Ukrainians and the Russians. It did not go down very well with many Ukrainians, including, by the way, the leader of the six million strong Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine, that is the Pope's own flock, Archbishop Sviatas Sviatov Shevchuk, who is the major archbishop of the Greek Catholic Church, who a year ago described that gesture as ill-advised and ambiguous, suggesting that it conflated the aggressor, i.e. Russia, with the victim, i.e. Ukraine. So flash forward to this year, what does the Vatican do? What does Pope Francis do? Once again, one of the stations of the cross during the Via Crucis was given over to reflections from unnamed Ukrainian and Russian youth. So two youths, one Ukrainian, one Russian, both talking about the pain and the loss they have suffered in the midst of this conflict. Once again, Many Ukrainians were unhappy. The Ukrainian ambassador to the Holy See dispatched a testy tweet in which he pointed out in response to the Russian youth who talked about you know, his frustration that his father and grandfather had been called to the front lines, his brother had died in the war. 
the Ukrainian ambassador pointed out that, you know, your relatives went into Ukraine not just to kill the father or the brother of this Ukrainian youth, but to wipe out his entire family if they had the chance. And, you know, sort of ruining that the Vatican did not make that point as part of this presentation. Point is, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? I mean, the Vatican did this last year. They could credibly claim to have been surprised by the Ukrainian reaction. They certainly can't make that claim this year. They knew full well going in that Ukrainians and their allies in the West, that is the White House, 10 Downing Street, the other, you know, the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the leaders of the Western powers, the leaders of the NATO nations, were all going to be unhappy. They made the choice to do it anyway, and that has been Pope Francis's approach from the beginning, to try to remain non-aligned in this conflict. Substantively, his position is closer to that of, say, Beijing, or New Delhi, or Brasilia, than it is to Washington, or London, or Brussels, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, and we saw that again. We also saw it in the Pope's Urbi et Orbi address, where the Pope, as is the custom in these Urbi et Orbi addresses on Easter, ticked off virtually every hot spot in the world. I mean, he, of course, he mentioned the Ukraine war, led with that, mentioned conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He talked about Syria and Haiti and Myanmar and Mali and Burkina Faso and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Ethiopia and Eritrea and Lebanon. It was the United Nations of papal concerns. You want to know the one place that he didn't mention? the word that never flowed from his lips during the Urbi at Orbi, China. And of course, China and Taiwan right now, tensions are at, in some ways, an all-time historical high in the wake of the Taiwanese president's meeting with the U.S. Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. On Easter Sunday, as Pope Francis was delivering his Urbi at Orbi, China is conducting a series of military drills that simulate an all-out assault on Taiwan in a clear message to the Taiwanese to get them to back down. And yet, Pope didn't mention that in this panoply of global hotspots. This is because, of course, the Vatican increasingly sees Beijing as a partner. They want Beijing to act as a mediator in the Ukrainian conflict on a variety of other issues. They see Beijing as an ally, potentially at least. And of course, there is the deal between Rome and Beijing and the appointment of bishops in the country regulating the situation of the Catholic Church there. Again, the fact that the Pope would, in a sense, go out of his way in a negative way to avoid irritating China, another clear sign of his commitment to multilateralism. Finally, and this is deep in the weeds, folks. This is deep inside baseball stuff. But Holy Thursday, you know where the where the Pope chose to celebrate the Mass of the Lord's Supper. He went back to a youth prison, the Castle del Marmo, which is on the outskirts of Rome, which he first visited in 2013, just 15 days after his election, held the Mass there, washed the feet of the young inmates. Now, that is significant in part, of course, because it symbolizes the Pope's outreach to the peripheries. But here is the other thing about the Castle del Marmo, and this is well known to Pope Francis. It is where the legendary Vatican diplomat, Cardinal Agostino Casaroli, it's where he would go virtually every week over the course of his long Vatican career. He spent hours and hours there acting as a kind of informal chaplain for the young offenders there. Didn't tell anybody who he was. He just presented himself as Don Agostino. They had no idea that they were being ministered to by the architect of the Vatican's Ostpolitik, under Paul VI, its policy of outreach to the Soviet sphere, the guy who was in effect the chaplain of the Helsinki Accords in 1975 that have been praised by Pope Francis as a model of multilateralism. But Pope Francis knows this. Casseroli is obviously near and dear to his heart. In the consistory last summer when Pope Francis created new cardinals, he praised Casseroli as a role model. The fact that he went there is another way, in effect, of the Pope signaling his commitment to multilateralism. And finally, reflections on Holy Week this year. I would give you traces of Benedict. This was the first Holy Week celebrated by Pope Francis without Benedict XVI. And if you think about it, it was the first Holy Week in almost a century 
with that Benedict XVI because he was born in 1927, so it was just four years short of a century. Three traces of Benedict throughout the week. One, every Holy Saturday is a reminder of Benedict XVI because he was born on Holy Saturday in 1927. He was baptized with the newly blessed waters of Easter on Holy Saturday in his small parish church in the small Bavarian town of Marktel am Inn. And so when Pope Francis baptized eight converts to the faith, he created for those eight new members of the communion of saints a special bond with Pope, Pope Benedict XVI because they were baptized on the same day. So that's trace number one. Trace number two was the homily delivered by the preacher of the papal household, Italian Cardinal Raniero Cantalamesa, for the Good Friday Passion Service, which was clearly, even though he didn't use Benedict's name, it was obviously an homage to the late pontiff. It was devoted to Nietzschean relativism and the will to power and the dangers that poses and how the message of, of Good Friday and Easter is, in effect, a rebuttal. Those, of course, are stock core concerns of the late Pope Benedict XVI. One has to believe that Canta La Mesa knew full well that he was delivering what amounted to a very Ratzingerian, very Benedictine message that night. And then, you know, just a final trace of Benedict, which we saw during this Holy Week, would be the fact that well, I mean, the spirit of Benedict XVI sort of hovered over the entire thing. And all I can tell you is that for anyone who was accustomed to sort of Ratzingerian thought and Benedict spirituality, Holy Week brought that home. As a footnote to all of that, speaking of Ratzingerian spirituality, of course, the liturgy was a core concern for the late Pope. And he used to complain about how in the post-Vatican II period, we put too much emphasis on the priest celebrant and not enough on God as the primary actor during the liturgy. You know, Benedict would always insist on putting a crucifix on the altar when he celebrated, which photographers complained, sometimes screwed up their view of the Pope. But his point was, guys, if your focus is on the celebrant and not on the crucified Christ, we got bigger problems than the quality of photography. Okay. Well, this would be a Holy Week very much to Benedict's liking because, as I said, Pope Francis, the star of the show, presided but didn't celebrate. You know who celebrated the Easter Sunday Mass? It was Cardinal Giovanni Battista Rey, Dean of the College of Cardinals. The Easter Vigil Mass, Cardinal Gambetti, the Archpriest of the Basilica of St. Peter's, and on and on. I could tick off everybody who celebrated, but I think Benedict would have approved of the fact that these guys clearly were not the center of attention for once. It was someplace else, and the celebrant was simply an instrument through which the action of God and the liturgy became visible. All right, quickly, two news stories to go through before we sign off. So during this past week, my wife, Elise Ann Allen, did a piece for Crooks about a story out of France where the Bishop of Lourdes has announced the creation of a reflection group to ponder whether mosaics created by Jesuit father Marco Rupnik, who now stands accused of a variety of forms of sexual misconduct and abuse stretching over 30 years, whether those mosaics ought to be removed from Lourdes. And the bishop's point is that there is a special sensitivity to such matters in Lourdes because it is, of course, a healing shrine. Many victims of abuse, many survivors of abuse, come to Lourdes seeking healing and reconciliation. And so this reflection group will ponder what to do. And it is symbolic of, or in microcosm, of a larger debate in Catholicism about when you have an artist who has, is revealed to have been, to have failed in some spectacular way, particularly sexual abuse. You know, should that art be ripped out? Should it be removed? Or can we make a distinction between the art and the artist and say that the art has perennial value regardless of the moral integrity of the person who created it? And it's not just a debate that affects Rupnik's work, by the way. In France right now, there is a similar conversation going on about the artwork of Father Louis Ribes. Rib, sorry, Rib, 
who was a church artist during the 50s through the 70s. His stained glass windows in Cuba's style now adorn a whole series of French churches, and they're having a similar debate about whether they ought to be taken out. On one side is tradition. Tradition would say all the way back, right, to the Donatist schism in the fourth century and the concept of ex opere apparato, we can make a distinction between the spiritual value of an act and the moral integrity of the person committing that act. Certainly when it comes to art and artists, the church has made that distinction over the ages. I mean, Mozart was a mason. We don't ban his sacred music from church. Caravaggio was a thug who committed at least one murder that we know of, maybe more. We don't rip his art out of churches. Fra Filippo, another famous artist from the Renaissance period, we know, seduced a young religious novice who was serving as his model for the Madonna, took her to his house, refused to give her back when members of her community showed up demanding her release. We don't run around tearing his artwork out either. And so the weight of tradition would say, yeah, we can make this distinction. Now, that has to be set, however, against a new sensitivity in the church, which is both moral and spiritual, to giving priority to the way victims and survivors of abuse react to this sort of thing. One of the reasons that the artwork of Ribe in France is being removed is because more than 400 survivors of abuse signed a petition demanding it. And those who are advocating the removal of Rupnik's artwork right now are doing so largely on the basis of not wanting to give scandal and offense to his victims and his survivors. How that is going to be resolved, I don't know, but I can tell you that it is going to be one of the most difficult questions to resolve, one of the thorniest questions uh, that the abuse crisis has generated for the church and one that is not amenable probably to an easy one-size-fits-all solution in part also because of practicalities. I mean, it's one thing to take a painting out of a church, but what if it's mosaics that dawn the entire church? What if it's an entire chapel? Getting rid of that stuff is complicated and expensive and difficult. How that's resolved, we don't know. Finally, this week, the Pope named British Dominican sister Helen Alford as the new president of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. The Academy of Social Sciences would be one of the lead organisms in the Vatican for promoting the Pope's social and political agenda. So things like his attention to migrants and refugees, his position on climate change, his positions on war and peace, his critique of free market, global capitalism, and so on. The Academy for Social Sciences would be, in effect, the Vatican's leading think tank to pursue and deepen the reflection on those issues. Sister Alford, is the dean of the Department of Social Sciences at Rome's Dominican-run Angelicum University, and also an advisor to a consultant for the dicastery for promoting integral human development in the Vatican. Now, uh, lots to be said there. It is an important position. Sister Alford becomes, in effect, a successor of Marianne Glendon, American jurist and longtime Catholic presence and personality, former ambassador to the Holy See, who held that position as president of the Academy of Social Sciences during the John Paul and Benedict papacies until she left to become ambassador. But perhaps one element of significance to this appointment is how it confirms and deepens what might be called the hour of nuns on Francis's watch. I mean, think about all of the nuns that he is appointed to high-profile, significant Vatican positions. There is Sister Raffaella Petrini, who is the number two official, the secretary of the Vatican City State. Alessandra Smirilli, who is the secretary of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Sister Natalie Beckwide, who is the undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops and arguably its most prominent personality. Francis just last year appointed two nuns to staff members at the dicastery for bishops, the uber-powerful dicastery in the Vatican responsible for recommending the appointments of bishops all around the world. And this, of course, is part of the Pope's broader commitment to empowering women in the church, but in a particular way, it seems there is a preferential option by Pope Francis for religious women in positions of influence and trust in the Vatican. 
of course, very natural. He himself comes out of religious life, history's first Jesuit pope. And so Sister Alford, in that sense, is another piece of a larger picture in which nuns, who often felt estranged and even unwelcome in the John Paul and Benedict years, we all remember, for instance, the investigation of American nuns during the, the early stages of the Benedict papacy, there was this sense of estrangement. You know, the, the UISG, the International Union of Superiors General, the main umbrella group for women and religious, sometimes couldn't even get meetings in the Vatican during those years. Now, not only have those doors been reopened, but Francis has made a point of identifying and elevating nuns to consequential, important, high-profile positions in his administration. And Sister Alford, Sister Helen Alford, is part of that picture. So Sister Helen in Boca al Lupo, as we say around here, that's basically a Roman way of saying good luck. And we will obviously be paying attention at crux to the Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences under your watch. All right, that's our show for this week. As ever, you can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site, cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com. While you're there, if you have the wherewithal and the time, if you could make a small financial contribution to helping us keep the lights on, we would deeply appreciate it. We love bringing you the news, both on the site and also here on Last Week in the Church, but it ain't free, folks. Our ability to do that is directly related your willingness to help us out. So if you could, we would be infinitely grateful. Think of it as a small Easter gift to Crux. And as ever, we will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.